the Lord be with you. And also with you. With you. Gracious Lord, Heavenly Father, in you we live and move and have our being. And we thank you for water, the water which sustains our lives, the waters through which we were born by your Holy Spirit, and the living water which comes from your Son, Jesus Christ. Help us always to appreciate and swim in and live in this water. In your Son's name we pray. Amen. 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 So it's not a, a big surprise that in a very arid country, waters and its saving effect is, is full and that there's some imagery around that from the beginning to the end of the Bible. In the beginning, the Spirit is moving over the waters, and in Revelation, there is the river of the water of life. And so you, you've got water on, on both creative, redemptive, and all those so we get, we get to dive a little more into the into the water theme today, and I actually want to start by reading the gospel. It's a, good gospel. It's a long gospel. It's almost as long as a sermon. I may not even have to preach on it. Read this. Read this story and, and do that. It's just kidding. It's it's too important. It's not good. So the the, the backdrop to this um, are two different encounters. One from last week. We have Jesus um, being approached by Nicodemus at night. And he talks about being born, born from above, born, from, born again, water in the Holy Spirit, all those type of things are part of, <clears throat> are part of that. Um, this encounter is a little bit different where Nicodemus sought out Jesus. It appears that Jesus is the one seeking out this woman, certainly seeking out Samaria, going essentially out of his way to go into this land that has different worship patterns and focuses than Jerusalem. Mm -hmm. And there's a rivalry. Like there's a rivalry maybe between, I don't know, New York and Boston or San Francisco and Los Angeles or, you know, whatever else. They're just different, different kind of things. But there's just more of a spiritual rivalry because there was a place called Mount Gerizim in Samaria. This is very close to this town. And that is a sort of a high altar where people had worshipped. People were mountains to worship and things like that. So Jesus is really coming into this area on purpose to recall and restore the people of Samaria to the, to the wider fold of the, the pasture of the Good Shepherd. Mm -hmm. And so this is where he is. Is he seeking her out? Some people think this is a, an actual seeking the person out, and then others, some people think there's some symbolism in here. I'm going to read some about that when we, when we get to it. We'll, we'll see how that goes. Um, but we're, we're still here early in this part of, of John's gospel. The other thing about water that's important here is this well of Jacob's. So in Genesis 33, we read where the land was purchased, but the well was on it. We, we read that it was uh, in Genesis 48, how it was passed down in the family. So this is a, a very important place. So again, it's not a place that Israelites have never been before. You know, Samaria was established by Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, Jacob at the well. So they had a, they had a version of Judaism, um, but just not, according to Jerusalem, the right version of it all. So this is why he's calling them home. <clears throat> these, are, these aren't Gentiles in that sense. Okay. Uh, let me see if there are any other little things I was going to say before I read. All right, so here we go. The Gospel according to John, chapter 4. Jesus came to a Samaritan city called Sychar, near the plot of ground that Jacob had given to his son Joseph, Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired out by his journey, was sitting by the well. It was about noon. A Samaritan woman came to draw water, and Jesus said to her, Give me a drink. His disciples had gone into the city to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, How is it that you, a Jew, ask a drink of me, a woman of Samaria? So she's talking about some taboos there religious and also a single man talking to a single woman was a taboo. 
Jesus did not share things, uh, Jews did not share things in common with Samaritans. Jesus answered her, if you knew the gift of God and who it was that was saying to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. The woman said to him, sir, you have no bucket and the well is deep. Where do you get that living water? Are you greater than our ancestor Jacob who gave us the well? And with his sons and his flocks drank from it. Jesus said to her, everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again. But those who drink of the water that I give them will never be thirsty. The water that I will give them will become in them a spring of living water gushing up to eternal life. The woman said to him, sir, give me this water so that I may never be thirsty or have to keep coming here to draw water. Jesus said to her, go call your husband and come back. The woman answered him, I have no husband. Jesus said to her, you're right in saying I have no husband, for you have had five husbands, and the one you have now is not your husband. What you have said is true. The woman said to him, sir, I see that you're a prophet, saying essentially, how did he know that about me? He's telling the truth. <laughs> but then she changes the subject. Our ancestors worshipped on this mountain, but you say that the place where people must worship is in Jerusalem. And Jesus said to her, Woman, believe me, the hour is coming when you will worship the Father, neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You worship what you do not know. We worship what we know. For salvation is from the Jews. But the hour is coming and is now here when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth, for the Father seeks such as these to worship him. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and in truth. The woman said to him, I know the Messiah is coming, who is called Christ. When he comes, he will proclaim all things to us. Jesus said to her, I am he the one who is speaking to you. And just then, his disciples came. They were astonished that he was speaking with a woman, but no one said, what do you want? Or, why are you speaking with her? <laughs> the woman left her water jar and went back to the city. She said to her people, come and see a man who told me everything I have ever done. He cannot be the Messiah, can he? They left the city and were on their way to him. Meanwhile, the disciples were urging him, Rabbi, eat something. But he said to them, I have food to eat that you do not know about. So the disciples said to one another, Surely no one has brought him something to eat. And Jesus said to them, My food is to do the will of him who sent me and to complete his work. Do you not say four months more then comes the harvest? But I tell you, look around you and see how the fields are ripe for harvesting. The reaper is already receiving wages and is gathering fruit for eternal life, so that the sower and the reaper may rejoice together. For here the saying holds true, one sows, the other reaps. I sent you to reap that for which you did not labor. Others have labored and you have entered into their labor. Many Samaritans in that city believed in him because of the woman's testimony. He told me everything I have ever done. So when the Samaritans came to him, they asked him to stay with them, and he stayed there two days. And many more believed because of his word. They said to the woman, it is no longer because of what you said that we believe. For we have heard for ourselves, and we know that this is truly the Savior of the world. The word of the Lord. Thanks, man. Thanks be to God. So, uh, a, a long story, sort of choppy in the sense it sort of goes back and forth, back and forth. The disciples are going, there are these parenthetical notations, uh, all this drama is after that. If you've seen the Chosen series, uh, this is depicted pretty well in the Chosen series. Um, so, a couple things I like to, to say about it. Um, 
not giving away any hints from my sermon, of course. <laughs> um, and then asking you all some questions and thoughts that you that you may have. So the very end of this story gives us one clue because we are in the sort of the same place uh, when we first hear something about Jesus. So how do we know? And how do we go and listen to Jesus? And how do we not just take the word of someone who tells us, but how do we have that experience ourselves? So there are, God has no grandchildren. God has no grandchildren. Okay, good. <laughs> yep. Um, the when, that's okay. <laughs> when the gospel comes to us, part of it is, is for us to take it up on our own. So that's one of the things. At some point, we have to be our own believers. <laughs> but the good thing is, this woman becomes one of the first disciples, or first apostles. She is sent. And earlier on, he has said, go get your husband. I don't have a husband that whole conversation. Mm -hmm. But she does go, and she gets people, and she brings them back so that they have this experience for themselves. And she doesn't have to ask them to come. They just come because of what she said. They are, that's right. He told me everything. And so they, and then they came. That's right. And so they, they wanted to see. That's uh, rather so stunning that a woman that's had five husbands would have that degree of, of uh, influence on a community. That, that, that somehow falls flat with me, but I don't know what to make of it exactly. Well, maybe the only people she hung out with were other reprobates, and, and so they were happy to follow her. I don't know. I mean, that's a good question, Martin. I'm not... But if somebody comes yeah. and tells you that they just met a person who knew things he had no other way of knowing, it would kind of pique the interest of the people. Well, I want to meet this man that told you things that Right, yeah. So another point that's interesting, there, there are times in the Gospels where Jesus, when asked who he is, when he doesn't say anything. Mm -hmm. But here early on in the Gospel of John, he says, I am he, the one speaking to you. So mm -hmm. he, is, he is doing that and making the claim, which is different even than how um, he other disciples were made. For them, it was John the Baptist saying, "Behold, the Lamb of God," or something like that. But this is this is different. He is one on one with this person uh, in the middle of the day, breaking some taboos that that come along with that. Could you clarify how she would know about the Messiah in Judaism, but she, and she's related to Jacob, but she's not a Jew? I mean, what do Samaritans believe as opposed to? what Jews believe, or do we have any idea? Yeah, no, they, they had a belief in Yahweh. They were still following the God of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Joseph uh, because of geography and history and those types of things. Um, I don't know enough, honestly, about how what differentiated the Samaritans from that. Maybe the Samaritans didn't follow Moses the same. Maybe it was, it's just the, you know, the setting up of Jerusalem and the Davidic kingdom and those kind of things where they, where Jerusalem was supposed to be the center of worship, that's where the Ark of the Covenant is. They kept their own worship. That's some of what I know, but I don't know the whole of it that way. She did know that the Messiah was coming. She said, you know, that, that I know the Messiah um, is coming. We have, yes, she yes, does. They, yeah. That was part they, of it. They knew something, but what was it that separated the Samaritans from the Jews that made them? You don't want to touch them. Somewhere in the mind, I feel like I've heard when they were in Babylon, Babylonian, mm -hmm. that, where, you know, yeah, Babylon. Babylon, 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 yeah, yeah. that um, the Samaritans kind of went more with the idols, the people with idols, mm -hmm. and kind of didn't stick to their religion right. as much. So they weren't as pure. As so they, I don't know if that's true, but it's in that my is, head. And that's actually a, a pretty good. Well, since we're talking about husbands and things like that, maybe this is a good time to read. So this is really one of the, the quintessential theologians and biblical scholars of the 20th century, Raymond Brown. I don't know if you can see this book uh -huh. uh, by Raymond Brown. But this is what he says about the five husbands piece. Um, 
So forgive me for reading another long passage, but here we go. Sorry. Jews were allowed only three marriages. Ooh. If the same standard was apl applicable among Samaritans, then the woman's life had been markedly immoral. There is no particular reason why Jesus and the woman about her, the conversation between Jesus and the woman about her life need have more than the obvious importance. However, since the earliest times, many have seen a symbolism in the husbands. Origen, from early on, saw a reference to the fact that the Samaritans held as canonical only the first five books of Moses. Okay, so they were. So they wouldn't have cared about First and Second Samuel, First and Second Kings, all those other kind of things. So that's a little bit to your point, maybe more than to your question. Others today think uh, through Second Kings, where the foreign colonists brought in by the Assyrian conquerors are so it, said to have come from five cities and to have brought their pagan cults with them. To your point, Laura. Um, since the Hebrew word for husband, Baal, also means master and lord, it was also used to name a pagan deity. Therefore, the passage in John is interpreted as a play on words. And we know that there's a lot of the play on words with born from above, born again, and out of these conversations. Yeah. The woman representing Samaria has had five other gods previously worshipped. And the Baal, Yahweh, that she now has is really not her Baal because Yahwehism of the Samaritans was impure. Doesn't say anything more about why impure. Such an allegorical intent is possible, but John gives no evidence that it was intended. And we are not certain that such an allegory was a well-known jibe in the time that would have recognized been recognized without explanation. And that's the other thing. John often recognizes things parenthetically, talking about terms or whatever that other people may not understand. Um, the other thing that's interesting is the woman claims to have no husband because she was lying to Jesus because she had matrimonial designs on him. <laughs> he points out in the parallel of Old Testament scenes, and this is true, that men and women have met at the well. And they have. Uh -huh. Jacob met Rachel at the well, and she brought him water and all those other kind of things. So you must have been a flirt. <laughs> right. And here's this guy talking to me, so maybe he's yeah. a flirt. And that's he's not a, done, so yeah. I mean, must like me too. What is that? And there is love involved, but it's a different <laughs> yeah. it's a different version of love. Uh, the fact that she was there at noon says something too. That's probably the worst time to come. People would come when it's not so hot, I would think. That right. may point to that she was somewhat of an outcast yes. among, her, among her own people. And that certainly how the Chosen series interprets it. Mm -hmm. She has to go alone that other people can't mm -hmm. because no one will be no one will be with her. And she goes at a time when the others wouldn't be coming. Yeah, yeah. That's how cool she got to be. Yeah. So a taboo, just as she's a woman, regardless of how many husbands she had, mm -hmm. taboo that she has had five husbands, taboo that she's a Samaritan. Mm -hmm. And so Jesus is, is breaking all of oh, these yes. yeah. these social constructs, these taboos. Because what's the most important thing really is her heart. And, right. and when we get to the letter to the Romans, we're going to talk about reconciliation because it, the, the word reconcile is used a number of times in that. And that is partially what um, God is doing. And if you remember the John 3, 16 and 17 is you know, that Jesus came not to condemn the world, but that others might be saved through him. So this is, he is living out those words mm -hmm. in, in this activity. As well, and she was powerfully used to take Jesus' message to the Samaritans. Many Samaritans from that city believed in him because of the woman's testimony. Mm -hmm. So she was. Yeah. What do you make of it? What do you make of it that she left her jar and went into the city? And didn't give him any water. <laughs> well, she's she, coming back. Nothing was as important as. I mean, she just forgot about it because she had a mission. To go. She, she's a lot like me. <laughs> <laughs>
Or she had something else on her mind. Or her thirst was quenched. Uh, yeah. And I, she didn't need so. water. So then, is yet. it symbolic? Is it actual? She's so excited she forgets. We don't know. There are a lot of symbolic lot. things there around thirst. And again, this takes us to Revelation, the, the last chapter. Come to the ones who want to come to the water, come. I'll give you something to drink. I mean, it's just that whole sense of how we thirst for God and how we, as people, often quench that thirst with things other than God mm -hmm. and find ourselves thirsty again and again and again, whether it is five husbands, five wives, you know, whatever else that we, we just, we go back to the wrong well in search of things. Uh, Maybe we go to the right well because we keep coming back to church. And we come to the right well. That's right. <laughs> I like that. Good. <laughs> That's good, Martin. Collins. All right. Uh, I think that a lot of this is focused on location, if you will. One of the big disputes between the Samaritans and the Jews is identified here about where the worship is to take place. And the Jews believed that the worship was in the temple and the temple was in Jerusalem. And the Samaritans were not in Jerusalem and basically couldn't really go to Jerusalem to worship. And so there was this great divide, if you will, between those who couldn't make it up the hill to uh, Cassius to worship at, you know, Good Shepherd. And so they, you know, were worshiping, you know, in the boondocks, if you will. And the folks up on the hill looked down upon those folks that didn't come to church. But I think that one of the most important phrases in this uh, is the identity of the Trinity again. And it's in that sentence in which Jesus says, those who worship him, meaning God and the Father, him, the Father, must worship in spirit and truth. And in that simple sentence, uh, Jesus is the, connecting the Holy Spirit himself as the truth and the Father for worship. And so it's important for us to not get hung up in our divisions about where, uh, but to worship the Father in truth and in, uh, in spirit and in truth. And that's my two cents on this particular uh, gospel. Thank you. Thank that's you. good. That's a good one. And that, that's a very good, mm -hmm. very good point. <clears throat> Mm -hmm. uh, excuse me. Jesus, so yeah, that'd be good. Jesus is, is also <clears throat> just not taking sides in that dispute. Jesus is, is really not pro Jerusalem mm -hmm. in any major way. It's <clears throat> and he was saying what what uh, <clears throat> Connor was saying. Connors was saying. Thank, thank you, thank you. Yeah. Uh, Rich has had his hand up for a long time. I think it's going to go to sleep if we don't let him talk. <laughs> okay, Rich. Uh, uh, Rob, you mentioned that uh, the comment about she may have had designs on Jesus. Maybe she thought he was well off. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> That's why I was ignoring him, Laura. <laughs> I'm sorry. I said let him speak. <laughs> <laughs> Um, but yes, the, the Jesus is really not taking sides. And actually, he's taking the side of God that you could be in Jerusalem, you could be in Gerasim, you could be in Galilee, you can be in Spain, you can be in Mexico, you can be in the United States, you can be wherever else. That it, it, Where we worship is not um, that sense of that great of importance, in, but that we worship in spirit and in truth. What other questions or comments do you have about this passage? Could I just underscore what you just said that worshiping anywhere almost gives us the attendant responsibility to take care of everywhere. And, and um, 
that it has an environmental overlay that how dare we just abuse some places and extract from others and feel comfortable sitting in what we place as a sacred space when in fact what we're doing is despoiling that which others have to live with or live through. Very good point. There's a sacred nature uh, of that. Um, very good. Thank you for that. All right. So continuing with this theory, uh, idea of water, let's go back to the first lesson from the book of Exodus. And um, there are many times during this 40 years in the wilderness that the people grumble. Sometimes they're given manna, sometimes they're given quail, and in this case, they're given water. And, and in, in this case, it doesn't seem like God is angry, but later on, we find out that this particular event is one of the reasons that uh, God does not allow Moses to cross over into the promised land. Uh, so who, who can read Exodus for us? Anyone? I'll read it. Okay, amazing. A reading from the book of Exodus. From the wilderness of sin, the whole congregation of the Israelites journeyed by stages as the Lord commanded. They camped at Rephidim, but there was no water for the people to drink. The people quarreled with Moses and said, give us water to drink. Moses said to them, why do you quarrel with me? Why do you test the Lord? But the people thirsted there for water, and the people complained against Moses and said, Why did you bring us out of Egypt to kill us and our children and livestock with thirst? So Moses cried out to the Lord, What shall I do with these people? They are almost ready to stone me. The Lord said to Moses, Go on ahead of the people and take some of the elders of Israel with you. Take in your hand the staff with which you struck the Nile and go. I will be standing there in front of you on the rock of Horeb. Strike the rock, and water will come out of it, so that the people may drink. Moses did so in the sight of the elders of Israel. He called the place Massa and Meribah, because the Israelites quarreled and tested the Lord, saying, Is the Lord among us or not? I find it very strange that the Lord and Moses took such offense in the fact that the people had nothing to drink and were complaining about it. I mean, you got to have water, you know, and and yet they they I can see when they were complaining about having manna again, mm -hmm. but water was you know yes, and if you read right after this. God send them into battle, and you don't want to send people into battle dehydrated, dehydrated <laughs> and thirsty, and whatever. Right. Else. And you're talking about lots and lots and lots and lots of people. So that that's a yeah thing. You need a lot of water. Part of the symbolism here is tied up in that last phrase: "Is the Lord among us or not?" Yeah. Which means if there is water, it means the Lord is among us. And if there is not water, if there's not sustenance, then maybe the Lord has abandoned us. The Lord is, is not with us. Uh, so a couple things to, to say, um, nothing extremely profound, maybe. I don't know if this wilderness of sin, uh, which is different, there is a wilderness of zin, Z-I-N, also mentioned in uh, other places. But these are different places. If the wilderness of sin was called that after the fact, because the people of Israel had sinned by complaining, huh. because remember, all of this was oral history mm -hmm. for a long, long time. None of this was written down for a long, long, long time to our knowledge. Right. It really wasn't into the time of David that a lot of this Old Testament, what we call the Old Testament, was written down. So all the oral history, all the way it was brought back together. So it's easy to think in that way of looking at it academically that it's 
the area started being called the Wilderness of Sin many years afterwards because that's where the people had been sinning. Um, and it, this is uh, this water, this well is in no way geographically where Jacob's well is. They're hundreds of miles apart. Ooh. This is really south of what we think of as Israel now, the Meribah um, and the Na and Massa are to the south, really between Egypt and Israel. Are there still places called that? Yeah. We don't have good geographic clues, even when we're no, no sh sure certainty of where Mount Sinai is, even mm -hmm. there are a lot of other places, so that's um, we feel pretty confident, but we just don't have the markers we would like to have about things like that. I think the name Wilderness of Sin is, I've never noticed it, but it's beautiful, actually, because, again, just like sacred places are everywhere, sin is everywhere, and the wilderness is everywhere. Really. Right. That's right. And, you know, this is Lent, and we are in our own wilderness of sin. Sometimes people who have really gone off the deep end one way or the other, we talk about them being out in the wilderness, you know, come back to civilization, don't, you know, all those ways that we we refer to something like this, maybe not this particular geographic spot. Um, other comments or questions about this passage? Rob, I read that the name Meribah means quarrel, huh. which yes. might be significant. Yes. Israel's quarreled and tested the Lord. That's right. So I think Massa means tested and Meribah means quarreled in that scheme. You might not so, want to name your daughter Meribah. Yes, I know. <laughs> Uh, I heard the Mary Bells, but not Mary Bob. Yeah. Okay, Collins. Collins, yes. Uh, Rob, I'd like to make a baseball analogy uh, to save Rich uh, having to come up with this one. Uh, uh, strike one uh, was what God said to Moses in this reading. In Numbers 28, God didn't say strike two, but Moses did strike two. And it was because Moses didn't listen to the coach in the dugout that instructed Moses, don't strike it, speak it. And that was the uh, example of Moses going beyond what God instructed Moses to do. The second time, the Jews were thirsty and were demanding water. And God didn't deprive the water of the Jews in spite of Moses' not following instructions and the play call. And it was the second time when Moses went beyond what God said to do that cost Moses to not just uh, get into the promised land, but only to see the promised land. So that's my uh, tying in numbers and this particular reading so that we have the, uh, the two incidences uh, clearly understood. Rich has an answer. Yeah, Rich has got something to say, regardless of your attempts to quiet him or to say it on his behalf. You let Rich. Go ahead and say. Oh, okay. <laughs> you, you knew I wouldn't let this go by. Uh, <laughs> you think it was significant that God gave them tap water? <laughs> <laughs> oh, brother. That's very true. Rich. Well, let me. Let me, you, uh, let me refer you to another passage in Deuteronomy, uh, chapter 32, verses 48, if you have your Bible and you want to look at it. 
So this is towards the end of Moses' life and tenure. Uh, and it reads, on that very day, the Lord addressed Moses as follows. Ascend to the mountain of Abraham, Mount Nebo, which is in the land of Moab, across from Jericho, and view the land of Canaan, which I am giving to the Israelites for possession. You shall die there on that mountain that you ascend, and shall be gathered to your kin, as your brother Aaron died on Mount Hor and was gathered to his kin. Because both of you broke faith with me among the Israelites at the waters of Meribah Kadesh in the wilderness of Zin, by failing to maintain my holiness among the Israelites. Although you may view the land from a distance, you shall not enter it, the land that I am giving to the Israelites. So it's interesting, uh, again, in this, that when it's actually happening in chapter 17, that doesn't, God doesn't appear to be miffed. Yeah. But later on, That's he appears that maybe myth. that, you know, this is, this is the Deuteronomy story. Uh, Collins was referring to the one in, in Numbers. Uh, academics think different authors. A lot of the stories are repeated. For example, this story is repeated in Numbers 20, uh, verses 2 through 13. So you, you get some of the stories just like in, in Genesis 1 and Genesis 2. They're woven together pretty well, but when you separate the creation story in 1 from the creation story in 2, there are some differences of note. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, we'll, we'll get into that kind of biblical scholarship another time, but that, that's part of how we have to understand and, and, and know the Bible. Just yes. like Matthew, Mark, and Luke and John tell the same story in different ways, different times. Yeah, Martin. Isn't, isn't Moses failing God by one, losing patience with his people and not believing that he's going to get them to water anyway, and rather than calming them and saying, it's, you know, it's right around the corner or we're going to find it or God wouldn't have brought us here. That is, is that what we're to take? I mean, I, I felt that frustration that, that, okay, here are these children that I've that you've put me in charge of, and they're just acting up, right? And, and what am I supposed to do with them? Um, that he's that he's he's lost faith that God's going to provide, and that his people are going to do the right thing. That 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 Moses is Moses in his own way, because in theory he's got insight and responsibilities and power given this his uh, staff and all that. That he's not exercising it. He's he's being petulant too. Is that is that what we're to take away from that? Because it, it it's it's sort of there, but you kind of have to look at it. It 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 looks it feels a little bit like a, a Ten Commandments or Cecil B. DeMille moment, right? Um, but it's 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 more than that. It's not just an excuse to show how powerful God is, right? I don't think so, but I, I do think it is, in the end, that the Lord provides. Yeah, yeah. And, and doesn't say, well, tough. Yeah, so yeah. the lesson in it would be that no matter how close to the line, I mean, they thought, we're going we're gonna to thirst to death. We're, I mean, they were they had a legitimate complaint, but they needed to keep the fact, no matter how long, have. Mm -hmm. long it went that God's message is just keep trusting me no matter how it looks mm -hmm. and how different this scene is from the woman at the well mm -hmm. where there is mercy and compassion and desire to, to take care of that thirst mm -hmm. where in this passage God is, is acting a little differently for a whole for a whole mob of people mm -hmm. Yeah, so the, part of that has changed. Again, thematically, the bottom line is the Lord provides the water. The, the, the Lord takes care of our thirst. And let us trust. Yes. Rob? Rob? Yes, Tom. I'd, I'd like to mention 1 Corinthians 10, 4, <coughs> to, uh, to tie this into the Old and the New Testament readings in that the rock in the desert was in could be 
read to be in, intended by God to be a picture of his son, Jesus Christ. And in 1 Corinthians 10, 4 is the statement that all drank the same spiritual drink, for they were drinking from a spiritual rock which followed them, and the rock was Christ. Mm. Mm. The rock of ages left for me. Shall we sing? Yeah. Oh, yeah. I've seen the altar. Yeah. 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 All right. Well, let's move on to the, to the song. Uh, perfect segue. Thank you, Collins, for Rock. Uh, the shout to joy for the rock of our salvation. Uh, Rich and Mary, if you would please read this um, alternately by whole verse. Psalm 95. Come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us shout for joy to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before his presence with thanksgiving and raise a loud shout to him with psalms. For the Lord is a great God and a great king above all gods. In his hands are the caverns of the earth and the heights of the hills are his also. The sea is his for he made it and his hands have molded the dry land. Come, let us bow down and bend the knee and kneel before the Lord our maker. For he is our God. And we are the people of his pasture and the sheep of his hand. Oh, that today you would hearken to his voice. Harden not your hearts, or as your forebearers did in the wilderness at Mer Meribah, and on that day at Massah, when they tempted him. They put me to the test, though they had seen my works. Forty years long I detested that generation and said, This... This people are wayward in their hearts. They do not know my ways. So I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter into my rest. We're the Lord. Thank you, Thank you God. God. Boy, I'm glad he's never sanguine with us when we don't do quite right. I mean, Jesus did a mighty work when he took care of it. That's right. Um, that last, those last words, that idea of rest. You know, we say rest in peace mm -hmm. now when we think about people. Um, when Jesus goes to prepare a place for us and brings us back that we may rest. Come to me, all you travail and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. I mean, that, that sense of you make it the, the switch you. that has come with, with the Messiah to, to offering that, offering that rest, even despite our waywardness. Mm -hmm. So again, that was pretty heavy punishment on Moses after all that he went through to not let him come. I mean, that's pretty. Mm -hmm. To me, the, the Old Testament, God is much more harsh. Mm -hmm. And yeah. Jesus is so and loving. He, and, and that's what Jesus' mission was to show the love of God and in spite of ourselves, the salvation of God. Mm -hmm. And that's what our mission is, to share the love of God. At our cathedral here in Nashville, um, we will occasionally invite Jewish scholars. And the rabbi from the local congregation came a few years ago around Christmas time and pointed out that their version, the Jewish version of God, is, is one who smites people and lays waste vast lands and gets angry and remembers um, when, when people haven't worshipped him in the right way, where our version, Christian version, is more like uh, 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 God is more like Santa Claus and that he's, he, he rubs our belly and says, there, there, and uh, you'll, everything's going to be okay and don't fret. And she says, you think you worship the same God? You don't, we don't. Our God... Our God, um, and the reason we believe the way we do is that when God made mankind in his own image, I submit to you, which God is more human-like, your God or our God? Ooh. Ooh. Fascinating. Laying waste. I mean, we, we remember. We stay angry. We hold grudges. We uh, do things that are irrational and that we, we have to live with for a long time and find a really hard way of forgiving people. Um, 
it's kind of moving to think about. Do you mischaracterize Jesus as Santa Claus, though? Um, she, she was saying that, that, that we all have images. I mean, we, uh, what what does God look like? Who is he? I mean, I mean, and I'm not saying that she's right. And and everybody was laughing, but there's some painful truth somewhere buried in some of that humor. Yeah. All right. Well, let's move on to the letter to the Romans. I'll read it. Okay. Thank you. Watch it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. A reading from the letter to the Romans. Since we are justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have obtained access to his, to this grace in which we stand. All right, stop right there for just a second. I'm going to have her read that again. And I think we could see how this passage equally describes the woman at the well. Think of the woman at the well as she reads this passage again, then just continue on. Okay. Since we are justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have obtained access to this grace in which we stand. Mm -hmm. And we boast in our hope of sharing the glory of God. And not only that, but we also boast in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance. And endurance produces character, and character produces hope, and hope does not disappoint us, because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit that has been given to us. For while we were still weak, at the right time Christ died for the ungodly. Indeed, rarely will anyone die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person, someone might actually dare to die. But God proves his love for us and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Much more surely then, now that we have been justified by his blood, we will be saved through him from the wrath of God. For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son, much more surely, having been reconciled, will we be saved by his life. But more than that, we even boast in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. The word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. So that word reconciled is used essentially three ways at the end of this passage and that's actually one of the things we read in our prayer book what is the mission of the church and the mission of the church is to, to reconcile all people with god to or to pronounce that and, and have them join in the reconciliation that jesus did bridging the gap um the repair of the breach as we read in isaiah not too long ago is that sort of reconcile so you think about Friends that reconcile, you think of Jacob and Esau that reconcile, you think of Peter and Jesus who reconciled afterwards, and it's just again and again and again uh, a reconciliation. And even really, I know we talked about Moses being punished, but he was going to die somewhere sometime. But there he is on the Mount of Transfiguration, alive, talking with Jesus. Obviously, some reconciliation has happened on Moses' behalf. You're welcome. Um, and that, that's the way that's and and how good that feels. Reconciliation it feels good, not this just sort of superficial shake hands and you're still grimacing and grinding your teeth, but true reconciliation and how that is is such a part of what Jesus did time and time and time again with people. Again, the, the we think of him as the living word. This is this is what he he did. I I, had, I I know that, that she was making sort of a light comparison and a sort of a joke or something, but I think there's something so important in, in what this rabbi said that Jesus just pats our back and rubs and says, be all right. He took our sin very seriously to the point of giving his life in a, in a very hard, hard, terrible way. Um, to to take care of that. He didn't just say, oh, it's okay. I'll, I'll make it okay. 
he, he, you know, he's not, I mean, the Santa Claus reference. <laughs> I know we're not supposed to take it so seriously, but it was very serious to, to the mission that Jesus came to earth to do. Um, not to just pass on the bat and say, well, I'll, I'll turn my head and not pay attention to, you know, your transgressions. He, he said, I will remember you no more. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I just had to. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and again, this, this essential theme in this, but God proves his love for us that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Mm -hmm. That is the same type of thing as Moses, maybe even the Moses doesn't get. Okay, you sin, the people complained and argued, they sinned, whatever else. Um, but while we we were still sinners, Christ died for us. He didn't wait for us to get perfect. So that is really a wonderful piece of good news. It sure is. Mm -hmm. And we just have to keep trying. <laughs> That's right. And this was that's where, in repeating that line, we've obtained access to this grace in which we stand. That's actually one of the reasons sometimes where we stand in church, where it says that people may stand or kneel. Standing is actually a symbolic act in reference to this passage and other like it that talks about we stand in God's grace. We don't have to be on our knees. We don't have to be humble all the time. Uh, contrite all the time, mm -hmm. repentant all the time, we, we have obtained this. access to this grace in which we stand. And so therefore in standing, that's that's part of what we oh, thank you. That's do. good too because I miss kneeling, but that's a good it's, so it's not that we don't it's not that we don't kneel. Well we don't but, but that if our only posture is kneeling, what does that say about our understanding of what God has yeah. done for us? Yeah. 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 That's good. So standing's like an affirmation. Yeah, it is. I accept it. Yeah. I, I can stand up now. And We've stand. obtained access to this grace by faith from Jesus. We're not standing on our own merits, but because Jesus has lifted us up that way. Good readings. Mm -hmm. Yes. Any other, any other questions, comments? All of these things are well. pretty cool. Mm -hmm. So good. I'm happy. Rob, oh. yes, sir. Uh, you use the words uh, yet sinners, and that's the way it's translated in uh, many of the Bibles. However, this particular reading used the words still weak. And I look at those words still weak as being a rather weak version of sinners. Mm -hmm. I, think you, I think you can be uh saved and weak but i think the meaning of this in romans is that uh christ died not when we were weak but when we were still sinners and i think well, there's a that's what the word says in this translation it god, does yeah but oh. god proves his love for us and that while we still were sinners christ died for us uh-oh well the one that was sent to us by uh, yeah. Laura yes. has has the other translation about we're still weak. Yeah, it does. What translation is that one, Laura? Do you remember? <coughs> That's well, whatever it, in the le on the lectionary uh, page the site, and it everything except the psalm comes from the uh, NSRV version. Huh. I find great comfort in the while we were still weak language because aren't we all sinners? I mean, we're we're always going to be sinners. Yeah, and I think like we also right, but that but that that we recognize our weakness is what it's like. We recognize our hunger, or we recognize our thirst. When we're weak, we recognize we're lacking something. Yeah. With, with being a sinner, I'm not sure we recognize we like anything. We got what we want or we think we do. I, I, I like that. I like I like that translation, Laura. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'll let you and I can duke it out sometimes. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you, my friends. It's uh, great to be with you. Good to see you, Patty.